Thank you so right? much. <laughs> How are we? We're doing right. we? very well. <laughs> so, have you had a good convention? Um, I have. It's always, a, there's something, about, you know, I love the horror community. Because um, they're, uh, they're, curiously, the kindest people like mayhem. I don't know what it is. <laughs> In cinema, let's just keep it that way. Hopefully, for entertainment. Carnage and kindness. I do, I'm not bedfellows in my you know, general <laughs> assumption, but for some reason. A bunch of big teddy bears. And we get teddy bears. We yeah. are. Covered in blood. Yes. But teddy bears. And we're like, we love you. <laughs> so bizarre with a knife in the head. <laughs> <laughs> it's all love here. It's like you come here and you're with your friends and you're with your tribe and it's a safe place, as, as weird as that sounds to say. Because <laughs> we got killers walking around, people in masks. Does it work? Um, yeah, I, one of the more charming uh, visions was, was watching a family uh, who were just really supportive of dad, who just has a Jones for the undead, and you know meticulously had his costume uh, crafted, and mom's there, and the kids are there, and all just kind of like it's his thing. Yeah, could have been football, it could have been no. Yeah. Dad, dad wants to be dead, and he's <laughs> and they're, they're just here for him. And I love the support within the family. Well, my husband is terrified of me. <laughs> really? In the best way. He just looks at me like, What do you got going on? Yeah. Well, I, I have a thing for dolls. We have a podcast called The Dolls of Horror, named after our, all of our favorite killer dolls. And I collect doll replicas of, from all the movies, the Chuckies, the Puppet Masters. And they're all on display in our living room, staring at him as he's watching television. And he's just like, I swear, if one of those things moves. <laughs> He is a very, that's, well. He loves me. He loves you, that's a lot of love. That is a lot of love. And then I brought him to his first convention, and he saw all of this, okay. and he's just like. There's more of you. Yeah. That's all. Okay. Whole hotel. <laughs> <laughs> but now he's into it. That was a, a couple years ago, and now he's into it. Now he's like, okay. Total cosplayer, what you got going on? He refuses to dress up. He wanted to do it for Halloween. You know, oh. I know, no fun, no fun. But. Anyway, he loves me. That's my point. He loves me very, very much. <laughs> What's not to love? Yeah. How's your time? Everyone been enjoying it? We're like day yeah. two of this thing? Yes. Yeah. Right? Day two's always You've been the to many of them? Coolest. From every year? Yeah. yeah. Do we have any first timers? Oh, awesome. that's exciting. Love it. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so, Billy, tell us about how you got started in acting. Take us to the beginning. A school play, you know, where we all hopefully started. Program offered it. Um, Haran Camp in Oak Heart Lake, Wisconsin. So here, there was a theater camp I went to when I was like 10 for, for a few years. That was fun. Doing musicals, sharing mm -hmm. roles with four or five different people, doing Oklahoma, two numbers, and then someone else would be yeah. taking the hat and the vest. And it was just a great way to, um, I mean, I loved sports as much. It was just a, it was a team sport, you know. It is. Theater was a team sport. Oh, absolutely. You know, with girls. And, uh, <laughs> it was a little more fun. Exactly. Was, you know, whatever turns you on. But it was like, uh, you know, it was a cool place to um, learn a lot. And um, I had started auditioning for roles in Chicago in the early 80s teen scene was kind of happening on the screen, it was a good time to be 18. Yeah. And then uh, moved to Cali, uh, took a year off what would have been film school because I was really interested in telling stories. Mm -hmm. The acting was something that was just, well, it, it felt natural and it was um, a point of entree into that industry that made sense. And it kind of just took off, which was cool. And uh, it started, just simply from that passion. So I encourage anyone, it's never, certainly never too late to start to, you know, study, mm -hmm. practice, encourage your kids if they want to do it. It doesn't bite entirely. Teach them critical thinking and discernment yes. and, yes. you know, but it's a fun place to uh, explore um, a lot about humanity, you know, having played a lot of questionable characters, which was never my intention. 
Well, that's the funnest character to play. Well, yeah, was, was, was finding dimension, right? Even if it's not necessarily on the page, if yeah. you're playing a fairly, you know, harrowing dude, you know, what trauma led to that? What was the, how do you unpack that weirdness? And, you know, what was, not that you want to mind sympathy, but I always found it interesting to mind understanding mm -hmm. the characters. Like, why, mm -hmm. how does this track? And then it's become more real and thus more scary and more interesting. And you can also then play with like kind of a catch and release. You can create a safe, seemingly safe, safe space or comfort so the audience you know, drops the shoulders a bit and then you get them, you know. So it's just keeps a bit of a roller coaster ride, you know. It's kind of fun. You know, Jamie and I are both diehard musical theater fans, and so since you said you started in musicals, I wanna know if you have a favorite musical. Oh uh, uh heck yes. Um on screen, I guess, which is mm -hmm. where I was first exposed to them. Well that's not true. I saw I <coughs> being in them was where it really started, but where it really was amplified was uh, stuff from the uh, MGM canon, you know, under a gentleman named Arthur Freed, who was a producer who brought like, from the Wizard of Oz to Singing in the Rain to sort of, uh, just meet me in St. Louis, all those great Judy Garland, Judy Kelly musicals, and Vincent Minnelli direction, and Stanley Donnan. Those films were, um, seminal for me because they were, they were just the peak of the you know in the early 50s in america you had this great collision of um contemporary art hitting the world stage and shifting focus um to the states with abstract expressionism you had modern dance and you had jazz that was just turning into rock and roll but moved beyond you know big band bebop. So you had this collision of expression that the Yanks were just crushing it in, you know, coupled with technological advancements in cameras. So you had now three-stripe technicolor. So it was just dizzyingly beautiful and expressive. And the things that they could do, uh, certain effects, the brightness, and then insane talent. And the musicals, what they would do is hire well, MGM, the studios, would find variety acts on Broadway um, who were specialty, who were you know, specimens. They were, they were the, you know, the, the athletes of the day. They, were, they could do incredible things um, and weren't saved by editing or special effects. And they would create vehicles around them. So you had insane talent on every level, firing on all cylinders, and those movies just made me just in awe. So musicals really, yeah, they float my boat. Um, Same, really, both of us. There's we, some bad ones. But we nerd out real, majorly on musicals. There's some real good ones out there. I had the pleasure of doing uh, Chicago on Broadway. That was yes. Fun. And uh, right here at the Lyric Opera, oh, the yeah. Sound of Music. I remember that because I was, or, yeah, I was working in the opera building in an office at that time, what, 10 years ago? And um, I went in right smack into you, coming out of the, I was late for my ballet class, going home in Rogers Park, you know, and we, yeah, we, I, we, we hit the turnstile at the same time, I almost knocked you over, and then you got mobbed by like little old ladies, <laughs> and I'm standing there in the corner, my people. you know, my people. well, I was like, Vicky, I'm gonna go, love you, but I'm standing by the corner, and I'm like, did that just actually happen? <laughs> it was very I dressed as, as Captain Von Trapp? No. <laughs> you actually were kind of like this and hat on still and yeah, but yeah, that, that was my one interaction with you running back home to ballet class <laughs> well, from the opera building. Nice to see you here. Congratulations. Thank you. You're Full circle. Full circle. <laughs> Sorry, I'll let you get back some questions. I want to hear what you guys are, yeah. Sorry, are interested in. Do we have any audience questions at the moment? All right, well, we'll just ask again. Wait a minute, there yeah. it is. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, if you had to pick a different occupation that was not singing or dancing, <coughs> what would you do? Um, I believe. Very people connected. Thank you. Well, to that end, it would be. Um, 
venture. Like, so I, I'm, I love giving <laughs> advice. I love the sound of my own voice. <laughs> and I, I'm really, I, I'm really, I like being, I don't know if it's generous with others, but I love, I love, um, I'm good at pattern recognition and quickly identifying what someone's strong suit is. And I love trying to encourage them. It's just something that I'm weirdly, I think, kind of good at. And I love the moment where, you know, sometimes people are too close to things, especially me. And I love it when people do it to me. You can be too, we all have it. We're too close to something and it takes a third party to just go, dude, just, and there you go, now hit it. And uh, being able to do that while perhaps um, the business model around that, I imagine, would be to enable a vision, first facilitate a vision, then enable it to kind of flourish and be the gift that keeps giving and keep doing whatever it is, if, if in fact the pursuit is noble. So there's a lot of these interesting, you know, cause-based impact funds out there that are looking for smart and noble pursuits that help community or, uplift, you know, just the business model of, of uh, enabling good work, you know, something like that. And I kind of, it's what I diversify in anyway, but I, I wish, you know, I don't wish anything. I mean, it's perfect, what the hell, you know, even with foible. Um, but that, if I didn't pursue the arts, although storytelling is critical to everything we do, and whatever it is you're all into, uh, and if it is story, realize there's applications beyond just making movies for storytelling. Like, everyone needs storytelling. Um, this I discovered uh, later in life. I couldn't believe how uh, valuable uh, a pursuit of, of in the arts uh, was to all industries because communication is critical. So some form of business that would inevitably find a you know backdoor into art. <laughs> so I guess yeah. sorry for the little roundabout answer. But, you know. What do you do? Me? Yeah. You groaned before you said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I asked such a deep no, no, question. No, 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 no. It's, no, no. It's, it's interesting. I'm, I'm a, I've been a street street addict uh, a nurse for a long time, and I'm, I'm waiting to take boards for a psychiatric nurse practitioner. I've got all these degrees. Street medic, back it up. Can I get a round of applause for this? Yeah, Thank you. What a service, man. Dude, that is awesome. So, like, caseworker? Uh, Antipsychotic injections, removing sutures, whatever it is people need if they won't go get help. If yeah. You're awesome. Losing their, uh, with their, you know, starting to go towards psychosis, stuff like that. So, when you started talking about that, That's amazing. Yeah. That's, yeah. you know, uh, isn't it wonderful when you just dig? I, one of my favorite, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, thank Please. you. You know, one of my favorite things to do is, you know, I find every every flight I take or every time you're in line with someone, I just find there's nothing really arbitrary. And if you take two minutes to just ask the person sitting at your elbow, I call the angel at your elbow, right? Mm -hmm. You don't know, you, you kind of dig in and inevitably you find some curious connection something they have they have a piece of information for you or you have something for them and that is like I just, it's just the best of the human experience I just find it, that that discovery versus search we're so caught up in search by these pretty pervasive algorithms that we surrender to right oh if you like this you love that I want this where's mine yeah. send me a car send me a cheeseburger <laughs> if you just like surrender to the mystery every now and again you know you uh and it, and be curious, yeah. man. That's the that's the that's the brightest part of my day was that piece of information. That's beautiful. Never yeah. groan before you give that answer. Yeah. That's like you know, that's so noble and cool, and 
this is where storytelling comes in. You know, if you're here, you love movies, right? You love media. You know, your story is fascinating. And in context of um, continuing to inspire people, mm -hmm. telling that story is really, really interesting. You know, I mean, we need more. It's just nice to know it exists, right? It's like, oh yeah, Humanitarians there's actually people in the on the street field. helping people with these issues. We, we fill in the cracks that government doesn't, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Congrats yes. again. Sorry to go off. Is there any other question? Yeah, we have one right here. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Um, so I just want to say Titanic remains to be one of my favorite movies of all time. And I have actually spoken to a couple other actors about their experience, and they both said that there was a genuine feeling of terror while they were filming the uh, sinking scene. So um, was there any moment during that when you felt terrified? Um, I'm terrified now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lights! <laughs> They're like, I'm working! <laughs> Um, terror, certainly concern, <laughs> because, you know, the beautiful thing and the luxury of that, that uh, project was the scale, you know, they built the ship out of metal and wood, nine-tenths the actual size, did not take much to imagine what it was like being on the ship. They broke it into different portions, and then sections of it were actually operated and run on, the, on hydraulics, and, you know, they employed the, the back end uh, industry uh, and expertise of people who were involved in major infrastructure projects, not filmmakers. So it was amazing, and you felt comforted by the caliber of talent, you know, focused on making this, you know, tons of metal and wood with people upon it slowly sink into cold. North Pacific waters in the winter solstice. Well, it might as well have been the North Atlantic. It was cold, it was cold, it was winter in Mexico and Pacific's chilly. And we had a tank full of salt water that this thing would go in it. And as it sank in real time beneath your feet, it didn't take much to imagine what it felt like to not want to get wet and make sure you didn't get stuck under something. And it was all in completely safe but the impression was, um, I imagine, terror for many. I was fascinated, I was concerned, but again, in character, <laughs> someone who, until that moment, didn't care about the boat was irrelevant. Of course, Cal was getting off, he was not concerned by it. He was more concerned by finding his girlfriend. And uh, that was, a testament to the hubris and the insanity of that character. But um, once that stuff started happening, I uh, I felt that he should behave like a cat. Like, how long would it take to just not get wet and step on it? <laughs> Which was very practical as an actor's test. He was like, wouldn't it be great, Jim? <laughs> So he never gets wet. He's like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> sure, okay. Uh, wouldn't it be interesting if the only person who doesn't get wet anymore didn't go? Too. But it was funny, and we kind of played that until, uh, yeah, I was up to my chest and eyes water. Um, so terrifying. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Now but, that you think about it, I mean, yeah. you know, sure. But it was, it was it never felt unsafe. Um, my general feeling on the film. I had a great time on that film. Um, I found you know, it very pleasant. And of course, you want to get cold and wet. It's a movie about a sinking boat. Well, I have a, I have a question for a, a fan of our show who's like a big fan of Demon Knight. Um, okay, so he said, the collector is such a great character, but very little is revealed about his origin. So did you have your own headcanon as to who this character was, or inspirations in other characters that helped you bring him to life in such a memorable way? Um, it's a very good question. Yeah. No headcanon, great term. Yeah. Let's totally borrow that today. What's your headcanon? What's your headcanon? He's a writer, he's a horror uh, yes. novel writer. <laughs> <Daniel> <laughs> Can you tell? Yeah. 
Um, because it, a majority of the time was spent um, in uh, the moment, in improvisation and creating. But the foundation, that, the, the, the space that allowed for that um, was the inspiration of, um, at that, around that same year, just before, uh, Robin Williams's uh, genie in Aladdin had come out. And that was the first time I realized that because he is such an improvisational genius, and clearly half of that dialogue wasn't in the script for Aladdin. Um, they animate two actors. Actors don't fit into like it. Just you, you really, most animation seemed pretty stiff and straight up to the point where you just realized, oh my god, they just animated. They just you know clearly videotaped and animated Robin Williams going off and they just made this made him blue and float. You know it's amazing. So the, the liberty of that character who had supernatural powers could conjure what he needed to make a point at a very fast pace with almost a rim shot behind it. Once I got the, the green light to, to make the character um, funny and scary as a result, create again that safe space that catch release we talked about, mm -hmm. false sense of security through comedy, Go for the juggler, right? You know, um, and uh, that push pull was became very entertaining a device, and really, I think, often overlooked in horror. To be honest, I, I think it's the best part of horror. We had it in the fifties and the sixties. There was always a bit of, you know, maybe I think you had it more under censorship because we needed more than just gore and sex. You needed you needed thrills and chills, and part of thrills is comedy. Is 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 nervous laughter and release, and it's just so overlooked in the you know in the, the you know, buzz saw today. Um, but the um, the humor definitely uh, just encapsulate Robin Williams. I think inspiration and uh, no room for a head cannon because I was too busy just making shit up. Uh, you know, <laughs> Bring me a sponge. Yes, okay. let, me, let me do that. Where's the, you know, gotta get rid of the coat and hat. How are you gonna do that? I don't know. Fuck this cowboy shit. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. How's that? It's like, it's great. It's okay. Keep going. Do you have any other audience questions? Yes, yes sir. Um, it was years later that I found out you were in Critter. Yeah, one of my favorite movies when I was growing up. Yeah. I'm an eighties baby, so I grew up with eighties horror movies. Mm -hmm. So how did you end up getting that role? <laughs> did you say horror movies? <laughs> <laughs> what, what was the process? Um, was that your first movie? And how uh, how did you end up getting the role working with Dee Waller? So. That was my our, I think second movie. My first movie was Back to the Future. It was one of Biff's bullies going around. Match it with my character. Two lines. Get him. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> but I shared the second line. <laughs> and, um, then, uh, uh, then Critters came about, which was, I don't remember how I got it. Might have been an audition. I think it was an audition. The dork from New York. I, I could do that. <laughs> Steve. It's a great movie. Billy Greenbush, Scotty Grimes. Yes. And uh, Steve Herrick, great director. Might have to do some Mutant Ninja Turtle Madness. I love that film because it really acknowledged, I, I love the device of how the uh, aliens can morph and, and shape shift. And, and one of them has trouble doing it. It's just really interesting. <laughs> he was trying to uh, get it going. He's having an issue. And, uh, and Terrence Mann was in that, right? Also, right? Yes. You know, That's Broadway true. extraordinaire true. himself, true. right? No, too true. <laughs> and uh, oh, they were obsessed with MTV. One of them wanted to be a pop, look like a pop star. Oh, best hair ever. Best hair. Terrence's hair? Uh, mm. 
<laughs> yeah, I was a big Buckaroo Banzai fan as well. Same period. Yes. Love me some Buck. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Um, which of your roles would you say were the most challenging and why? I did a early on pre dead calm. I was hired to play one of the Hillside Stranglers with uh, Dennis Farina. He played uh, Buono and Bianchi, he played Kenneth Bianchi. And that was a living person. That was, he was doing time in Sing Sing for these horrific crimes. It was rare that there were, you know, psycho two psychopaths working together, let alone family. And it was, a, it was, it was heavy. I was young, I was really, I was, you know, barely 20, something. I think that came before they'd come, or came after. I wanted, it was early, it was just, it was a lot of weird material to deal with as a, as a young man. Dead Calm was easier because it was fiction, and I was exploring the, my process of learning about letting things happen to you rather than forcing results and improvisation again and you know finding mining understanding under characters but when you're playing someone who was real and then trying to get into the headspace of you know what led to that behavior was uh, was was challenging put it that way, it was a lot to unpack. Um, and one of the things that was frustrating that I kind of attached to was, it was amazing that he was able to fool so many psychologists in the forensic space, because, you know, what he was was, you know, he was a mediocre actor, he was lying in these interviews, and I could see it as an actor, I was like, he's a bad actor. And the people who, who had to trust him didn't have a, a discerning filter on performance and were convinced otherwise. So that was interesting to me because he was really doing his best to avoid conviction that's captured using whatever head trip, head cases he could. And uh, it was a lot. It was challenging, but it was a lot. Yes? Your sister wrote a song he performed on Charm. Or co wrote a song, I should say. No, she wrote. Uh, Okay, um, do you remember it? <laughs> I do. It's called Everything's Kind of Good. It was a little ditty, but it was a, yeah. You want to sing a little bit of it? <laughs> <laughs> Darkness falls on everybody's faces, evil calls, or otherwise you chase it. But I'm of the mind that everything's kind of good. <laughs> Round of applause for each other. You should get together on your uh, musical uh, theater. Yeah, I, I just studied musical theater in, in college as well. You so. need a baritone. I mean, yeah. Dude, yeah, hey. let's yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. Come see us. And she like. also wrote a song. If, has anyone seen I Woke Up Early the Day I Died? Okay. This is a little known film. One of my favorites. I produced, I produced a few weird and wonderful films. This was one of two with a group um, called Muse Productions, Chris and Roberta Hanley, who brought us Virgin Suicides and... Uh, Buffalo 66 and like a lot of nine great edgy indies of the day. Um, we did a Jim Thompson adaptation called This World of the Fireworks with Gina Gershon and uh, Cheryl Lee and Rue McClanahan. It's an amazing uh, film. Um, and we also did My Antidote to Titanic, and I did not that it needed an antidote, but after seven months of, you know, blockbuster experience, I wanted to just scratch my, you know, indie heart and um, an itch, and uh, produced a film, a silent film, which was written by Ed Wood Jr., which um, was never produced. And it was this kind of opus, it was just this amazing, bizarre and hysterical morality play or crime spree of a, uh, a thief 
who escapes a mental institution to drag, of course, dressed like a nurse to get out of there in order to, uh, uh, and, and, but he has a sonic disability and only Ed Wood would create a, 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 a silent film with a central character who has a problem with sound. Just genius. And so we got like 35 cameos of the most amazing people in the film. Who's in the cast, friends? He's a big fan. Give me some names. Well, uh, Rue McClanahan. I, uh, I'm no, to think of the not Rue. In, in, oh, uh, oh, like, um, in uh, I Woke Up Room. Do it. <laughs> do the thing. Right All right. Stage right now. Sorry, sorry. Um, Stardust. Tippi Hedren, Star, uh, Sandra Bernhard, John Taylor Thomas, Christina Ricci. Uh, Max Perlick, Ron Perlman, uh, come on guys, help me out. Uh, Ricky Schroeder, Blake Garrett, uh, the Phoenix Sisters, um, it goes on and on and on. Uh, Will Patton, uh, John Ritter, Vampira. The original. Mm -hmm. Was that the last Milo Nuri film? The, the, what? the last film she did, Elpira? Yeah. Amazing. I can't believe when you saw it. Um, and um, it's wonderful, but my, it's filled with crazy music. Wonderful music, a lot of original and a lot of great needle drop. I put my fee back into paying for all the music. I ended up kind of re-editing the film with Dodie Dorn, who's a brilliant and went on to, had, had cut a Memento uh, before that, and then went on to do, you know, just recently did Army of the Dead. Amazing lady. Um, and my sister wrote a song, back to the point, called Binka Bink in gibberish Italian. And it's hysterical, it's absolutely nuts. And there's a moment in there in the bar scene. It's, the film is like if John Waters and Buster Keaton had a baby, it, it, it was, you know. This thief, this character. So it's it, it really adhered to the rules of Chaplin esque, you know, very uh, tight and concise physical comedy with colorful, campy aesthetic. So it, it had a long story as to what its release scenario was like. It was just bizarre and nefarious characters in, in the mix. And uh, it found, it was the first film to be entirely leaked to the internet. I don't recommend watching it that way because it's low res. <laughs> However, you can get, you can order a DVD. Yeah. Um, it came out in Germany for a while. That's around, but look up, I woke up early the day I died for a laugh. <laughs> You know, I also loved your sister's song. I know this isn't Lisa panel, but I love that your sister's... Should have done together. Right? I wish. I love the song she wrote that wasn't used for Freddy's Dead. Like, The Horse is Over, I think it was called. Yeah. I can't sing. You but tell her. I, I will. And it's so beautiful. And they ended up using the other closing song, the rock song, instead. But I love her ballad. Where did you hear that? Does her her song? Um, YouTube. Wow. Yeah, YouTube. Um, pretty. It's good. It's so pretty. I mean, honestly, I was also looking up the rest of her music because I have one of her albums and I really like it. Okay, and I wanted to find more albums, and that came up, and I'm like, wait a second, what is this? And then I went down this whole rabbit hole. <laughs> we do have time for one more question. So very prolific on the heels of that. Lisa's I want to go way in the back because we never get to the back yet. I, I found him one of the funniest people I had the pleasure to know. He's, I think funny people are smart, and smart people are smart. You choose to be funny because it's fun to be funny. And he is hysterical. He's, he's a, a pun, punster, we're the wordsmith. We just hit it off from day one, uh, you know, in that manner. Like, it was, you know, He's very quick, um, and um, I had nothing but respect for the dude because he was, you know, first in the water, last out. So I had no problem, but, you know, he, he was um, 
He expected your A game all the time and challenged you. And I love that. Some people weren't up for that. Some people were. It just depends what your vibe is. But we, you know, I adore that man. He was cool, funny, and, um, you know, a pleasure to work with in that respect. He was, man, my experience was curiously, maybe it was unique, I don't know, but I'm glad it was mine. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard that as well. You know, that he was really smart and fun to work with. Yeah, you just, you know, I think you gotta be, contingency is a big deal. Mm -hmm. But if you can make the, you know, he challenged you to come up with good ideas. Mm -hmm. And then said, great, I'm glad I thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> he made you create. And that's what it's all about, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, everybody, Mr. Billy Zane. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you for sharing uh, your stories. I wish we could have asked, gone around the room like that. There's oh, yes. a kind of, you know, amazing people out here. A pool of uh, interesting people. So, keep, you know, keep touching others. Let me rephrase that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Billy. I'm going to write it down. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.